Uh, we are getting everyone's cameras up and ready, including mine, which is a different function. There we go. Excellent. How's everyone doing? We're really excited to have so many folks here today. Uh, we're going to hand it over to Evan, who's our co-sponsor from the National Security Law Society, introduce everybody, and then we'll take it from there. Evan, go ahead. Sounds good. Thank you, Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Evan Keeler. I'm president of the National Security Law Society at Georgetown Law. We're really happy to be partnered with this event. Um, I really do think it's important to discuss how the coronavirus is going to affect the future of national security because I think it has a wide range of implications. And that we thought there's no better partner than this with uh, than Lawfare because they really are thought leaders in this area, and we look forward to working with them in the future. Today we have a great panel of Benjamin Wittes, Morgan Taylor, Scott Anderson, and Susan Hennessy. So Scott, I'll let you take it away. All right, thanks so much, Evan. Um, you know, as Evan noted, I think today's conversation is an important one. It really is just the beginning of a conversation. Um, the thing I kept thinking about over the last few weeks, uh, it goes back to my senior year of high school, which was the year of 9-11. Uh, and the day after 9-11, September 12th, I had a history professor who had spent the day before kind of comforting people, telling people everything's going to be okay, everything's, this isn't as big a deal as it seems like, uh, in part because we were in the D.C. area, a lot of us had family members at the Pentagon or other places that we were worried about at the time. The next day, he came in and he said, guys, I'm sorry, I lied to you. Everything has changed, and this is going to be one of the most impactful events of your life. I think that's true of COVID-19 as well. Um, it is going to fundamentally change the way we think about a lot of things, about national security, about a lot of other issues. Uh, we don't 100% know how yet because it's a crisis that's playing out in slow motion. Um, but we can start to have that conversation at least, and that's the idea behind today's panel. Um, just a few technical notes for you all. Uh, we are obviously dealing uh, this remotely, so bear with us if we hit any hiccups along the way. Uh, we're slowly getting better at this platform. You'll notice at the bottom of the screen there's a Q&A button. You can hit that button and put a question in. We'll be turning to questions uh, relatively quickly. We want to make this a pretty interactive event after we kind of just have a little conversation among ourselves. So just put your questions in there, and we'll be coming to those uh, towards the end of the session um, and turning to you to ask them. Uh, I'll put you on screen. Uh, it'll initially have your camera and mic turned off. If you don't want to be pictured, that's OK. Uh, but if you're willing to share your face with, along with the rest of us, that's great, too, um, to share the kind of audience and so everyone can uh, see you and hear you ask your question in person. Um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Let me just open up my notes here. Um, Susan, I wanna go to you first to kind of open up our conversation. Um, because right now we're experiencing one of the most fundamentally new parts of this COVID or post-COVID era, and which, which is this increased reliance upon remote technology. A shift to a world where a lot of what we used to do in person, hopefully one day we will again get to do in person, we are relying on these new digital technologies to do. Now, hopefully we'll get better at them in the next week or two, but it certainly opens up a whole new universe of potential vulnerabilities and questions about how to best manage that technology and those functions. What can you tell us about your thoughts about what that'll mean in terms of cybersecurity and other issues that you work on in this space that, and that we cover here at Lawfare? Yeah, so I think this is an important point and one that is going to become increasingly important as we sort of see the consequences manifest over the next couple of weeks. You know, I think initially we're talking about a difference in quantity, not a difference in kind. So as more and more transactions and sort of business and, and daily lives are conducted online, that just expands sort of the attack service. It gives more and more opportunities for malicious actors to capitalize on vulnerabilities. And that said, sort of the policy response to that stuff isn't particularly different from what we've seen before, right? It's kind of patch your systems, don't reuse passwords, right? It's sort of the, the, the wash your hands kind of basic cyber hygiene um, that we all know and love. And so um, I, I do think that we're going to understand the importance of that in a new way. It's going to become, uh, you know, we're going to see more and more companies and different types of, of various institutions paying the price for not being really, really careful. Um, but, but I think by and large, the biggest transformation is just going to be in a not not type. That said, there are some sort of new uh, opportunities here. 
right? So we've talked at Lawfare about um, getting different types of phishing attacks. Lots of people have been, uh, uh, you know, talking about getting fake Zoom links or, you know, invitations to collaborate in workspaces that don't exist. All kinds of things, right? Those are sort of the um, the kind of crude opportunistic things that, that we tend to see. Um, I think there is one other way in which um, we really are potentially looking at something new here. And that's uh, what happens whenever you pair uh, targeted malicious cyber opportunities uh, activity with a moment of generalized vulnerability. So um, we saw how devastating ransomware is when it attacks a hospital, sort of in the NotPetya and, and WannaCry in, uh, incidents, and uh, you know how, how critical sort of securing health services is. Um, imagine ransomware, uh, a ransomware attack on a major hospital, on HHS, at this precise moment. Um, we talk a lot about uh, you know, attacks on the financial system um, at a moment of systemic global instability and, and insecurity, sort of targeted actions that might not have had that big of an impact in other contexts, you know, might actually provide sort of the nudge into, you know, more systemically important or, uh, or, or really sort of consequential outcomes. Um, you know, and then of course there's the flip side of all of this, which is what are sort of the opportunities of everybody moving into uh, to more and more digital technologies, particularly when it comes to things like health surveillance, right? This is one thing we've seen, uh, particularly in Asian countries that have been able to respond to this pandemic. Um, part of sort of the feature of, uh, of this pandemic is that so much data and information is emanating from every one of us, not just about our physical locations, but about our temperatures, our symptoms. Um, the United States has historically been really, really uncomfortable with using that to inform public health in over ways. I think we might see a shift now. Um, the, the thing that's different about the United States and some other countries is that uh, it's unlikely that the United States government is going to become big actors in this space. Our, our laws are um, are just a little bit too complicated, and I think our suspicion of government is, is a little bit too deeply entrenched. Um, but I do think that we might see the private sector sort of stepping up and capitalizing on digital information in, in a totally different way. So um, I was thinking the other day about uh, Starbucks doesn't allow people to carry guns in their stores. Whether or not you're in a state that allows open carry or not, that's a policy and, and security decision they've made for, for their own company. Um, there's nothing to stop Starbucks from requiring that people sign up with an app that measures their temperature or, or otherwise provide particular health information in order to enter those premises. And so um, those are the kinds of choices that uh, I agree with you, your sort of your original premise, which is that the world is going, this is going to be a, a really sort of cataclysmic event uh, and that it's really going to alter things moving forward. Um, I think that's the reason to be really, really thoughtful about what exactly we're doing right now and, and how these choices might play out in the you know, I think it's really interesting to use the metaphor of hand washing, right? Because that's this idea of sanitation in the physical realm has long been a metaphor about what we think about in the cyber realm, about keeping good hygiene, about how your online presence, your online tools. Um, but that's something we've seen a dramatic shift in the paradigm over the last two weeks, right? Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, it would have been crazy to think of city issuing citation because people are sitting too close to each other and risking exchanging body fluids or sneezing on each other. Um, if cities, many of these cities could issue citations for not washing their hands physically, I suspect they would. Are we gonna see a shift in that direction now for cyber as well? If we're in a much more interconnected society where we have that a higher level of risk and contagion um, if everybody's relying on these same cyber tools? I don't know, it, it's, it's possible. Certainly the risks have been known and it's been insufficient to sort of overcome uh, barriers to legislative action. Um, I, I do think sort of the lesson is probably one of simplicity. So in cybersecurity, people tend to, uh, you know, want uh, artificial intelligence or quantum computing, these big fancy things that are going to come in uh, and, and solve all of our problems. Um, and, and the solutions tend to be pretty basic, pretty much about sort of individual empowerment, not, particular, not particularly sexy, not even particularly technology-based. So it's a little bit of the lesson of sort of the pandemic right now, right? It's, it's not fancy drugs and, you know, maybe some vaccine will come. It is washing your hands and not having physical contact with people. And so I, I, I think that the, the more likely and immediate outcome is, is maybe a realization of that and, and sort of a, a shared collective responsibility, not just in sort of how we, how we uh, interact with one another in, in the physical 
physical world, but also how we are sort of interconnected and reliant on best practices in, in cyberspace as well. Margaret, let me turn to you uh, for this next question, because of course, you know, we as individual citizens aren't the only ones dealing with this whole new set of challenges. Uh, it is, in fact, all our governmental institutions as well, whether it's uh, the courts, whether it's local government, the people that we rely on for these services. I spent several weeks before this crisis broke out trying to get a permit for a renovation, a minor renovation. Uh, that's a whole process that was surprisingly in person. Um, and uh, they're still figuring out how to do remotely. How have we seen the institutions of government um, stepping in here and saying, hey, here's how we're going to adapt to this new environment of social distancing? So it, it's a good question. And, and I have to say, um, in looking around at the landscape uh, of how the government institutions have responded, I've actually been a little surprised at, at how well um, some of them have done. Um, so for example, um, and let's start with the courts. Um, I, I see the courts adapting, um, not completely, but they're they're getting there. Uh, most appellate courts are limiting or avoiding in-person hearings, so that's an adaptation. They're, you know, you know, other than that, though, they're largely still operating. Um, and part of it is that federal courts, you know, they already use electronic filings. They accept briefings, briefs and filings electronically. They can you know, issue decisions electronically. Um, they, there is a history of offering oral arguments by a video or telephone, and that's, that's, that's what they're doing now. Um, so that's been sort of interesting to track. Um, and I just would say uh, regarding the courts, um, there, is, there are a couple of provisions in this uh, bill that this large over $2 trillion stimulus bill that passed uh, that was at the request of the Department of Justice uh, that relate to this issue. So one of one of the provisions gives the federal courts more uh, ability to do uh, video tele teleconferencing for more types of um, proceedings. Uh, in particular, proceedings that that are criminal in nature and where the defendant, you know, can is, would normally, you know, have the right to, you know, be in the court. Um, but this particular bill sort of gives the courts more leeway to do more of those procedures uh, via teleconference, which, which is interesting, and I think probably the right thing to do at this particular moment. Um, in the bill also, the, uh, the, the legislation gives the Bureau of Prisons the ability to release more prisoners for home confinement if they don't pose a, a, you know, a risk. Uh, and it, it also gives prisoners the ability to do a visitation via teleconference. And so, I, I think this is sort of an interesting and remarkably quick action um, on the part of the courts and now with the legislative branch coming in and helping the courts um, with, with that transition and adaptation. So that's sort of where the, where the courts are at this particular moment. In the executive branch, uh, you know, I would, I'm sorry, yeah, the executive branch in particular, I'm, I'm more familiar with the State Department. So I'll just give you um, something I'm seeing there, which is, uh, you know, in this pandemic, the State Department has had to really adjust. It's in a different uh, environment than they usually in, obviously. One huge challenge has been getting Americans home. There's 50,000 Americans around the world that are trying to get home. They need help because there's travel bans in those countries. Um, and so we've seen the State Department sort of shifting its its resources and its attention to this task, which it normally, you know, wasn't doing very much of. Now it's, it's, there's lots of people dedicated full time to that. Department of Defense has been called in to hopefully uh, use their access to, to aircraft to help bring people home. Um, so you've seen the State Department, you know, shifting its workforce toward that goal. Uh, another thing I just want to note from the State Department is that, um, the office in the State Department that normally coordinates foreign aid, so foreign aid going from the foreign aid going from the United States to other countries, is now coordinating uh, responses that have been going out from our embassies to other countries to say, does your country have uh, you know personal protective equipment, um, the uh, respirators? Does your company does your country have these things that you could sell to us? So it's like a reversal of this function in the State Department that's used to giving out foreign aid. Now they're actually coordinating what can other countries, including in some instances developing countries, provide to the United States. So um, that goes to, I think, this broader point about leadership, um, the United States, uh, and going forward, what 
what it's going to mean for the United States to be seen as so struggling domestically at this time to deal with this pandemic and not, as far as I can see, offering a whole lot of leadership on the on the global stage. Um, and you know, getting back to the broader theme of this panel, that's one that's that's like a huge thing that I will obviously be we will all be tracking is how does American leadership and the idea of American leadership change on the other side of this pandemic? Um, and a lot of that will be dictated by how America handles itself and also its, uh, its assistance and coordination of other countries and international institutions going forward. Well, talking about how the country handles itself, we were just a handful of months away from one of the most important things the United States does every four years, which is a presidential election, and every two years, a congressional election, both incredibly important. Even before the coronavirus crisis, we knew election security was going to be a major, major concern. Uh, concern about foreign influence, concern about uh, voter access, and other issues uh, that are now kind of becoming one with the international security element of foreign interference, or at least have a lot of intersections there. Um, but uh, the coronavirus throws a whole new set of concerns in there. Um, Susan, you've done a lot of work on election security. What are your thoughts about how coronavirus is going to impact that effort to move towards addressing elections and ensuring the integrity of our upcoming, very important upcoming elections? So I'm going to move a little bit closer to the mic. Hopefully that'll um, let you guys hear me a little bit better. Um, no, I, I, I look, I think the immediate impact is, um, is, uh, is an obvious and negative one. And that's that the hope of getting any kind of legislation passed between now and November has pretty much evaporated. I think there were sort of the last final hopes that maybe some legislation could be tacked on to the stimulus bill. Um, what we're seeing in the bill that's actually, you know, the, the, the bill that's actually moving forward um, is that there's about $400 million for elections security, but none of the provisions about uh, requiring paper ballots, requiring social, requiring uh, cybersecurity, uh, particular cybersecurity standards, or requiring sort of automatic uh, post-election uh, auditing to happen. And so you know, that's just kind of dead in the water, I and mean, it's not going to happen. And um, I think if we sort of take stock about what happened in the 2016 election, um, that we made it to this point without getting bipartisan elected election security uh, bills passed it, it is pretty astonishing fact um, and, and a real condemnation of Congress at this point. Um, that said, you know, there's also sort of the immediate question about how exactly the, the pandemic is going to impact the election itself and whether or not we're going to be able to vote safely and securely. Um, obviously, most Americans vote by showing up, going out in public, standing next to lots of other people and voting at polls. Um, there's concern about that. So we've seen already a number of states delay delaying their primaries. Um, that's less of a concern whenever you have an incumbent running essentially unopposed uh, again, and you have a Democratic nominee who is sort of more or less presumptive at this point. I think it would be a much more contentious issue even uh, a month or so ago if we were in a stage in the race in which um, delaying primaries actually uh, was perceived to have some kind of impact on the outcome. We would have really serious questions about legitimacy, who was making those decisions and why. Um, you know, I think the the answers are uh, in the immediate relatively clear and also relatively simple, and that's that we need to move to uh, universal vote by mail um, as an option. So whenever people, you know, there's always sort of bad ideas always pop up in moments like this when, um, you know, people say, oh, well, everyone should vote by internet. We should have phone voting, right? Like all, the, you know, this moment doesn't make any of those intolerable risks more tolerable. Um, but we do have systems in place that, uh, that function quite well and that provide us with backups and, and universal vote by mail, no excuse absentee balling, ballots, uh, absentee voting, you know, that's all kind of common sense stuff that we really should expect to be rolled out now. And, and I think what we really want to see in terms of the practical election security at this point and election security in a context in which um, some people still need to physically access to the polls, physically access the polls and poll workers tend to be elderly people, you know, by and large, uh, sort of statistically. And what we really want to do is create as many options for voting as possible and really try and have a healthy, resilient, diverse system with, with a lot of depth to it because you could you, you, I, because you can imagine a situation in which a particular jurisdiction um, isn't actually able to, to go to the polls for, for a particular period of time. Um, you, you want people to be able to have uh, mail-in voting as an option then. For those places where people are able to go to the polls, we want to reduce the load, make it easier for people who do need to physically show up and vote to keep their 
their distance to allow poll workers to sort of um, uh, safely handle the influx. And so, you know, unfortunately, um, uh, election security and voter access issues are, um, are political issues in this day and age. And so um, it's going to be difficult to overcome some of those um, traditional incentives, um, but th there really is no, no excuse not to. Um, you know, we have plenty of time between now and the election. And, um, you know, unlike the primaries, there, there is not the option of delaying the November election. And so, uh, you know, states have fair warning, they have a lead time now, um, and, and no one should delude themselves that this, um, this pandemic will be uh, completely controlled by then, that it won't have um, consequences in their own state by then. Um, because of course, you know, we, we should also be preparing for a possible re-emergence, you know, right in the fall in which election co elections concerns will be most acute. That's what I get for trying to keep you from hearing me sneeze. Uh, just a quick logistics uh, intercession here because we've got a number of attendees join uh, after our first few minutes. Just so you know, we do have a Q&A function at the bottom. So if you have a question to ask or a comment you want to weigh in on, go ahead and drop that in the Q&A. Uh, a few folks have already used it and we will be pulling those up at the end uh, in uh, just a few minutes um, to kind of have a little exchange with you guys. Uh, but just flagging for that, that you guys are there, uh, that that's there for you guys. Ben, I want to take this next question to you, um, because a big reason why the election is so important, of course, is because we're electing the president. And in most national emergencies, he's the person or she's the person who takes the lead. It's the office that uses the authorities given to them by Congress, the authorities vested them in the Constitution, whether everyone agrees on that or not, what the scope of those authorities are, but they usually take the lead in emergency response. Um, but that's not something we've seen happening here. The universe of actors who are really taking the lead on how the United States is managing COVID-19 is broad, ranging from local mayors, local governors, not local or statewide governors, all sorts of other officials. Um, the president still has a role, but we've seen the president, this president at least, perhaps not take as active a role as some might like him to, uh, in contradiction to some of the concerns about executive power that we see play out in other environments where they're often talked about in speculative fiction and other things about kind of pandemic type situations. What does the current a balance and, and kind of multifaceted approach to COVID-19 mean for the presidency and the significance of the presidency in an era where this may be a more dominant national concern? So it's a really interesting question. Let me give, let me glance at it from three different angles. The first is your initial observation that a lot of the uh, uh, key actors here are people other than the president and specifically uh, state and local officials uh, has two causes and it's important to disaggregate them. The first and uh, which of them, by the way, is more important is an interesting question. <clears throat> the first is that the constitutional arrangement in the United States um, makes a, uh, uh, a non-bioterrorism pandemic situation uniquely ill-suited to presidential leadership in the sense that the power, if you think about what the power that's being exercised here, the power to force people to stay at home, the power to order small businesses to be closed, these are police power, right, which are uh, reserved to the states, not the federal government. Um, moreover, the federal authorities that are being wielded are congressional authorities, principally, the power to spend huge amounts of money even the powers that the president is wielding are powers that are delegated to him by Congress, not powers like in a, for example, military conflict, which are organic to the office, right? He's not exercising the commander in chief power here. So one reason is that this is a set of issues that is uh, actually, if you imagine like how the founders would have thought about how the country would have responded to an epidemic. They wouldn't have imagined that the country would respond to an epidemic. They would imagine that Philadelphia and Pennsylvania would respond to yellow fever, right? And that's exactly what we're seeing. So that's one reason. The other reason is the other utter incompetence and management failure of the president 
himself in the areas in which he is responsible. And so one thing that's a kind of interesting experiment is if you imagine uh, vigorous presidential leadership and what are the things that the president has control over here? It's not, you know, qu you know the, the stay at home orders. It's not that sort of thing. It's the border. It's uh, the Defense Production Act. It's the uh, border oriented entry quarantining. Uh, and it's the public health, the national like CDC public health administration. And finally, and most importantly, and I think this is the biggest failure, the failure of messaging, uh, the failure to send a consistent message to kind of corral people to work together. So I, I think the reason that we're seeing the presidency uh, not being such a central actor here is partly that the, we have the president that we have, but it's also partly that we have the constitution that we have. Um, so that brings me to the question of, is the presidency diminished as a national security actor by our performance here? Which I wanna go back to a point that you started with Scott and that Margaret also talked about, which is, is the United States diminished, right? Because the, the president is, when you're talking about presidential leadership and, and what the presidency is capable of, you're also talking about what the country is capable of. So we are now heading into an environment in which uh, we are going to spend $2 trillion as an initial down payment, already having a $1 trillion deficit. We're going to have, as of yesterday, we have the most reported cases of anywhere in the world despite having had a lot of notice that this was coming. So we've objectively handled this badly in comparison to other countries, including, by the way, I don't ever like to compare us unfavorably to uh, uh, Chinese communists, but we have been less effective in, uh, in our response to it than the Chinese Communist Party has. I wouldn't want to use their tactics, but I do, uh, I do think it's notable that we have not performed well compared to them. Um, and I, uh, and so I think the, the and, and we are heading into a catastrophic and economic uh, performance as a consequence of all of this. So first of all, U.S. prestige will suffer as a result of this uh, and, for, and with all the attendant consequences that Margaret described. But one consequence of that is that the presidency as the, the principal instrument by which the United States engages um, in foreign policy will suffer an immense loss of prestige. Um, I don't say this with any glee, but it should. Um, because the argument for the American style of presidential leadership is that it is highly effective, highly nimble, uh, and can muster enormous resources on short notice. Uh, and that is exactly what it failed to do here. So how much of that is Donald Trump? I think a lot. Um, and I do think that this is a situation that we uh, was exactly the type of situation that those of us who were, uh, which I assume includes an, a lot of people, it includes everybody on this panel, and I assume a fair chunk of the audience as well. Everyone was concerned about having a person like this wield the powers of the presidency, was in part concerned about how catastrophic the management would be in the event of a crisis. Now we're seeing it. And one of the consequences of it will and should be that the presidency and the country in general has less prestige uh, in the future. Uh, and I don't think there's any way around it. That was a reservoir of credibility and trust and confidence that took many, many decades to build and it will take many, many decades to rebuild. 
That's a great segue um, to my next question for you, Margaret, because because the presidency isn't the only branch affected by this. Uh, we've really seen Congress take a, a more central role than we might have expected in the case of an invasion or one of the more conventional things we may think of when we think about national emergency. You know, national attention has been wrapped at Congress as it debates this coronavirus relief legislation. We've seen markets swing thousands of points, you know, years worth of progress one way or the other um, that has led to uh, this situation where the Congress is really at the center of a lot of this. And as Ben notes, part of the reason Congress is at the center because it is uh, the thing holding the leash on the presidency. It can define a lot of what the presidency can and can't do, uh, at least in the most well-defined spheres of constitutional authority and statutory authority. So, so what is Congress's new role in all of this? What does this mean? If we're entering a coronavirus era where you know this crisis of the last few weeks is gonna become a recurring or permanent or perhaps just the threat of a quasi recurring or permanent uh, effect on us, does that really change Congress's role, the demands on it, and how institutionally capable of it is it of playing that new role? So it's a really good question. And um, the, the truth is nobody knows the answer. Um, I, I, I don't want to be overly rosy or optimistic about how well Congress is going to function in the weeks and months to come. I think the last couple of weeks have been a pretty exceptional time period where in the face of um, you know, a president and an administration that is um, sort of stumbling, struggling to respond, it, it has been Congress that actually has been able to come together and pass several major pieces of legislation aimed at addressing the various facets of the problem. So first, you know, testing and money for vaccine development, you know, now we're moving into more economic stimulus. So you're, you are seeing a Congress, which, as we all know, is traditionally sort of maligned as, you know, 9% of the American public approves of Congress or whatever. But we are seeing them perform in, in, a, in a pretty, pretty good bipartisan way. Um, so whether that sort of keeps up over time is certainly a question. Um, you know, I was reading today about, uh, we're all aware at this point, because we're sentient beings about the president uh, not invoking the Defense Production Act. And there, there's a lot of discomfort with that on Capitol Hill. And there's actually multiple proposals for bills to force the president to use the Defense Production Act, which is an interesting sort of turn. Um, I, I have my doubts about whether it will actually happen, but just that it's being discussed and, and debated is, is something I, I haven't quite, quite seen before um, during, during my time on Capitol Hill, seeking to force the president to, to do something like that. Um, institutionally, as Scott, as you know, you and I wrote a piece on this, um, there is this question of, you know, um, does Congress itself need to adjust and adapt the way it does its business in order to keep it safe as it does the work that it needs to do? So, you know, obviously there are various members on, on you know, both in the House and the Senate who actually have coronavirus. There's many, still many more who are quarantining or isolating um, because of exposure to it. And so, you know, I, I was watching actually on the House, the House floor proceedings today, just about an hour ago, when the House passed this huge two, over $2 trillion stimulus package. Um, and Nancy Pelosi had actually had to call back uh, the members of the House late last night because it became clear that um, Representative Massey from Kentucky uh, was going to uh, demand a roll call vote in the House. Um, so lots and lots of members came back uh, to the House. It didn't end up being a roll call vote because of a pretty extraordinary set of procedural things that, that, that happened uh, very quickly. Um, but the, it was, they could not pass the bill uh, without a quorum. They had to get a quorum present. And so Nancy Pelosi had to muster 216 of her uh, of the members of the House to physically come and be there. And they were actually sitting in the gallery where, you know, usually where the visitors sit because they were socially, you know, so distancing socially um, to, to avoid the spread of coronavirus. But it just shows that Although Congress is doing its role right now, it's, it's not been able to do it in a way, you know, for example, remote voting, 
which should be an option. There should be a fail safe for if not a sufficient number of members can get together and they haven't been able to, to do that. That's something I'll definitely be watching going forward because um, it was a it seemed like a struggle for, for Nancy Pelosi to get 216 people there for a quorum. Uh, and so what's that look like going forward? Um, I don't know, I, I've, I have concerns about that um, in really like the near term. So we're getting close to our halfway point and we wanna turn and start taking questions or comments soon. So if you haven't got a chance yet, go ahead into the Q&A button, drop your question or comment in there. We're gonna take as many as we can. Um, but I don't wanna stop this conversation today without going back to one of the themes that Ben and Margaret touched on briefly. I think it's really important here, which is going from the micro about how we each individually experienced this to the macro and how the world is experiencing it and what it means for the United States' role in the world. Um, you know, this crisis really uniquely has a sort of combination of push-pull dynamics. Uh, in some sense, it really gives a lot of justifications to narratives where uh, we want to pull away from the international community, right? Uh, because we're exposing ourselves to risk of virus, of contagion, through those sorts of international relationships that globalization over the last 30 years, 40 years, has made such an integral part, not just of our economies, but of our society in a lot of ways, and our culture. Um, at the same time, we also feel a, a bit of a push pressure to say, well, this is an international crisis. It's something that transcends borders. It's a true transnational threat. And that requires a coordinated response that, if anything, would encourage us to push out into the international arena and try and work with allies, find ways to come up with solutions to kind of, uh, you know, address these threats collectively because they are a, essentially a collective good. And you could see how this crisis could play into either narrative. So far, at least, it really seems like the Trump administration has leaned into the former narrative, uh, more of a pullback threat. And it's an interesting tension or sharp contrast with the United States after 9-11. You know, after 9-11, we saw the Bush administration really hit the point to say terrorism is a transnational threat. It's a collective threat that the international community has a responsibility to address, particularly failed states and other contributors to that. Uh, now, you can have reasonable debates about how effective those policies were, how right-minded or, or wrong-minded they were, but nonetheless it was a recognition of there being some need for a coordinated international response. We don't see that yet from the Trump administration. Maybe it will come, uh, but certainly their approach to lots of other issues really does seem to lend itself more to that pull, isolationist focus on sort of autarky and national autonomy way of thinking about national security generally that you can see lending itself here um, in a lot of ways. That's a long way to frame the question I want to come to you with, Ben, um, which is to say, you know, which of these lenses is the one that we are going to, as a country, um, in the near term and longer term, start looking at our obligations and relationships with the world? We are coming out of this post 9-11 era where we had a pretty aggressive international engagement in a ways that a lot of people have found destructive. And frankly, we are in an era where even the left and the right, there are elements there that, at least from a military engagement perspective, are urging for greater restraint and a greater focus on the home front. Is that something that's gonna translate internationally? Uh, or probably translate to this new sort of international threat in terms of a resistance to becoming global leaders again? Or is this a case that's gonna knock us loose from the idea that all international engagement can have that destructive consequences and encourage the United States to, to stand up and play the international leading role that uh, at least some believe it has effectively done in the past? So I don't want to answer the what will happen question because the answer to all such questions is, I don't know. Um, but I will uh, talk a little bit about, I think, what should happen. So I appreciate that there are a lot of people who believe, and I am to some extent one of them, that this the country is overextended and needs to have a somewhat smaller, uh, particularly in the military context, appetite for overseas adventures than it has over the last 20 years. Um, the, I also appreciate that there is an overlapping uh, nativist sentiment that uh, involves a certain amount of isolationism and disinclination to be engaged with the rest of the world in things like trade and immigration, that is an overlapping but distinct strain of thought. Um, both exist on the right, and particularly the Trumpist right, 
um, one exists also on the left, the other a little bit less so, except with respect to trade. Um, I think that to the extent that there's an instinct, and you can really see this in the Trump administration, to map this on to the kind of nativist strain of thought, uh, it's delusional. Um, nobody is talking in, in a serious way anyway about closing off the United States to the extent that it would take in order to control viral thread, th th spread. As long as there are flights coming in from overseas, as, which there will be, as long as Americans want to travel overseas, uh, you are not going to prevent highly contagious pathogens from coming into the country. Um, and so, you know, understanding that people react to it exactly the way you described in, the out, in your setup to the question, let's start by saying that is a delusional uh, construction of what the on the on the uh, continuum from very closed off by U.S. standards, but still trading with the rest of the world to ultra engaged neoliberalism, neoconservatism, uh, sending troops all over the world. On that continuum, there is no no place along that continuum makes us less susceptible to a new pathogen showing up. Right. So it just it just doesn't answer that question. The question that we have to ask when you're talking about what the role of US leadership is going to be is not like, do we want to build a wall? The wall, you, the wall's not going to be high enough. We're going to let some people in the border anyway, and the pathogens are going to come with them. And our people are going to go to Wuhan and bring it back, right? So there's, there, don't kid yourself that that's a way we're going to control uh, things like a virus. Here's the U.S. leadership question. Do we do the work to show how democracies using democratic tools can be effective in uh, ensuring public health? In other words, do we, uh, do we show leadership uh, of a type that provides a counterpoint to what the CCP did uh, uh, that is also effective? And secondly, do we do the science, which is an area we have traditionally led the world in, to develop uh, shorter and shorter times, as the saying goes, from bug to drug? Um, do we figure out therapies uh, in the short term, vaccines in the long term, create distribution mechanisms that actually get this thing under control? If we do those things, we will have a, a proud story to tell. So far, we are lagging in every indicator. We lagged in testing. Testing is the easy part. Um, we lagged in social control and we have led the world. Let's hear the USA, USA, we're number one chance in now in infection case, in cases of infection. So I don't think we have a very good story to tell. Um, and I don't think it's one that speaks of leadership. That said, if there is leaders, if we do show leadership, it won't be along the close us off to open us off, more globalization to left globalization access. It'll be upon the public health infrastructure response and the ability to develop, uh, uh, you know, biomedical responses, both on the vaccine side and on the uh, therapeutic side. Well, you know, I think the, the just to launch off that, that brings us to a good kind of conclusory thought about uh, this conversation and, and the reason why we're having it, really, uh, which is that whatever the spectrum of ideas that one uses to look at this perturbant crisis, 
Um, we currently have, uh, you know, a president that is going to take a particular view, and by virtue of having the bully pulpit and the reins of government, I have a very influential view. The way the Bush administration saw the world after 9-11 really set the tenor for U.S. policy for many, many years, sometimes reacting against it, sometimes reacting towards it, uh, but nonetheless was a strong defining trend. And we may see a similar moment here. Um, so in so far as we're concerned about how the Trump administration or other officials may be thinking about this crisis or reacting to it, it's important to start having these conversations, crafting those counter narratives and helping people think about the crisis, frame it, and look at the right solutions and the right balance so they won't get trapped into too narrow uh, a, a intellectual and ideological set of framing. And so hopefully today has been a good start in that direction. Um, with that, I think we want to go to the phones, if you will, or uh, to the laptops. Um, I'm going to first go to Ari Rubin, if that's okay, because I know he sent in a question actually beforehand. Um, Ari, I'm going to try and make you a panelist. We'll see how this works, and if not, uh, I can do it. You will uh, come up and you will see uh, your camera will be off initially with your mic, but you should be able to turn them one or both on as you see fit. There we go. Sorry, you're muted right now and you can come off mute and you can come on camera. Great. How are you doing? Very good. Hey. Now you asked a couple of good questions. Pick your favorite one. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll come back and take another one or two uh, towards the end. Well, first of all, you guys are awesome. Uh, thank you for doing this. I'm a devoted listener on the podcast. Um, so I did have two questions and I guess I will give you the softball, uh, which was the news uh, this morning that a man in New Jersey had been charged with, I presume, bioterrorism uh, violation for coughing on a, another person at a supermarket and claiming to have COVID-19. And as I understand Bond v. Washington, those charges basically wouldn't fly for a crime like this, which is purely local. Um, so I just wanted to hear your, your take on that situation. So, my uh, understanding or recollection is that we, we, I'm not sure exactly what the statutory site, but I think that person may have been charged under state terrorism laws. Um, so a number of states adopt, have enacted statutes that have state terrorism violations, some of which also have uh, amplifiers and multipliers for chemical weapons, biological weapons, and things like that. Uh, and so it's not federal charges, which was the issue in bond. Um, and also terrorism charges in general, they're not um, reliant upon a uh, necessarily a treaty basis like it was in Bond. Bond was a case where they were prosecuting, uh, I think it was a woman who put essentially a chemical agent to use it to poison her husband and her husband's mistress, if I recall correctly. Uh, I may have the facts slightly off on that. Um, but they charged one of the Chemical Weapons Convention in a federal violation. Um, but in this case, uh, in this case, uh, you know, this, I think this was a state violation. If it was federal, the federal statutes wouldn't have the same treaty reliance to justify the federal interest, which is what the government was doing there. Um, you know, federal terrorism crimes, I don't really think are subject to the same purely local requirement because they would have to, there's pretty well established that terrorism is something that rises to kind of a more national level of interest. So they don't need to work through the treaty clause in the Chemical Weapons Convention. I think that's generally right. Do you all have anything to add to that? So that I, is my impression too, for what it's worth. Yeah, so I, I think that all sounds right. Um, and uh, you know, Ari, you actually sound like you know you know more about sort of the underlying case law. Um, so I'm a little bit, you know, speculating here. One thing that is a persistent feature, though, of some unusual uh, application of federal terrorism charges is that instrumentality tends to be really, really critical. So um, every time there's a mass shooting, there's a big conversation about why wasn't it, why wasn't this prosecuted as terrorism? It, it, usually the difference is because if you use a bomb or a gun, and actually one area um, of sort of um, relatively uncontroversial uses of the terrorism statute has been as applied to anthrax hoaxes. So obviously there was a um, pretty limited number of cases with actual anthrax, but um, because of the, uh, the biological weapon and, and weapons of mass destruction provisions, that is one area in which um, the federal government has used terrorism authorities to prosecute essentially pranks. I mean, in some cases, you know, actually, you know, um, uh, attempting to, to sort of carry out political terrorism, but, but a lot of times just people mailing baby powder to people they don't like. And so um, it's just going to be one thing to, it, it will be interesting to see, um, you know, whether or not 
coronavirus and, and this live virus somehow ends up becoming, uh, creating a, a little subset of cases that, um, because anthrax hoax cases are this like weird little niche group um, of federal terrorism prosecutions that, that have some pretty strange fact patterns. Yeah, and remember along, I, that's a really important point. Remember as well that even if the substance is inert, um, that you can still be charged with making a terrorist threat. Um, and, um, and so coughing on somebody, I don't know the contours of the New Jersey statute in question, assuming which I do that Scott is correct, that that's how it was charged. But um, coughing on somebody, if you represent that you, you know, I have coronavirus and I'm coughing on you, could be construed as, as a, as a uh, you know, a bioterrorism threat, even if what you actually have is, you know, like a chronic cough, like I have. Ari, why don't you go ahead and ask your second, oh, ask your second question while I queue up the next question, or the next question is gonna be Rick, R-I-C, so I'm gonna to switch to you as soon as Ari's done asking this next question, but go ahead, Ari. Thank you so much. Um, so this goes a little bit more to separation of powers and the discussion we're having about the president vis-a-vis uh, -vis Congress, I suppose. Um, we've talked a lot about the restraints on presidential power uh, under various emergency exceptions. And you have a situation here, uh, as you've discussed, where uh, there's also concerns about the president doing not enough so I'm curious if you can speak uh, to the statutory and constitutional basis of whether the president has any affirmative duties. Um, and I, you know, just spitballing here, I'm thinking things like uh, the take care clause or the oath clause and sort of going from there. Ben and Susan, this sounds uh, you know, like a chapter from your recent book. So why don't, why don't you guys feel this one <laughs> to start with? Um. Look, the president always has a duty to take care that the laws are faithfully executed, both under the take care clause and under uh, the terms of his oath. Uh, that said, it is a matter for, and that I think does imply certain affirmative duties, right? Like uh, you have laws that were passed in order to do certain things, and there's a kind of negligence associated with not using them uh, for the purposes for which they were used when the situation is urgent. Um, that said, it is uh, the most political of political questions, uh, how, what counts as good faith execution, and if the president is uh, okay with his performance, which he clearly is, Yep. Did we lose Ben? And the Congress is not He's going to impeach him over it. And they are clearly not. The Senate is not going to remove him. Um, then level, um, you know, if, I, I don't know when I blinked out, but if the president is not, is satisfied with his performance, which he clearly is, and Congress is not going to remove him over it, and they're clearly not, uh, then that, along with his reelectability, is functionally the definition of satisfying the take care clause. And I wish it were not that were not the case. I wish you could kind of wave your hand and say, but wait, he's in violation of the take care clause. But if we could do that, we would have done it on January 21st, uh, uh, 2017, and we would have done it every day since. Uh, and so I think you're, it's any different today than it has been at any other day during the Trump presidency. Yeah, so I'll add briefly, yeah, I certainly agree with Ben, it doesn't present like a justiciable legal question. Um, it is like a, an interesting um, like con law exam hypothetical, right? The sort of inverse steel seizure that's happening. And like the bottom line is, you know, we never imagined a case in which we would need to force the president to act when it was clearly in the best interest of the nation to do so because the underlying presumption of the founders is that political accountability 
dispatch and, and uh, is going to be the, the, the thing that compels a president to act and that those forces are, are, are going to function. Um, you know, there is something really interesting about what's happening right now. And um, I, I really don't know that we've seen a parallel of the past, although World War II does pr provide some of um, sort of the relevant case law. Um, and, and, and that's really that this is a true 50 state emergency. And ordinarily, whenever we're thinking about um, the interaction between federal emergency, federal uh, uh, statutory emergency law and states and, and support to states, it, it's usually a case that there are a few states that require support. And so really what it's about is using the power of the federal government, um, right, to say, well, you know, Tennessee has helicopters and Louisiana needs them, so we're going to move it. Sort of FEMA is, they don't own things, right? They're just moving things around within the states and they're able to sort of uh, get over the, those, those coordination and collective action issues. Um, you know, the system is really not well designed for this notion of everybody is in an emergency at the exact same time. And that is actually what we're seeing is precisely the moment in which you really, really need federal action. You can't have states bidding against one another Another for masks, right, and driving up the prices. Like this is the exact textbook case in which you would want to see, uh, you know, sort of the federal government preempting those concerns. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I don't, um, I don't think we're going to see cases come out of this. Although I, I, I guess if we thought long enough, maybe we could think up a, a cause of action for New York or, or some other state, especially if they could um, demonstrate that the president was um, uh, behaving with the sort of disparately based on on some sort of illegitimate criteria, but, but assuming that, that this, um, this era is not going to produce those cases based on this action, you know, to Margaret's earlier point, um, I do think we might see some really, really interesting pieces of legislation come out of this, um, you know, really sort of addressing this very unusual circumstance in which we need the federal government to coordinate among the states because they cannot compete against one another. Ari, thank you so much for your great questions. I'm gonna bump you back to attendee and bring in Rick. Thank you. Um, Rick, uh, I understand you don't have video capacity, so we're just gonna hear the audio on this one. One second, let me just find your name and add you here. All right, Rick, we should be able to hear you now. If you, uh, you have to take your mic off mute. Rick, can you hear us? Well, Tell you what, maybe I'll just read Rick's question out loud and he can join us if, he, if we figure it out. Rick, I think, I, I think this is directed towards you, Ben. Um, in, your, in your interview with Terry Gross, you said that the law and the Constitution do not allow Trump to cancel the November election. If he makes that proclamation anyway and the red states comply, what do you see happening? Um, so first of all, I, I, before spinning out a hypothetical like that, I just want to describe how legally improbable that hypothetical is. The, the election day is specified in federal law, the date for the choosing of the electors. Um, and state laws are all written to comport with the federal law. So in order to change the election day, uh, you would actually have to uh, uh, defy federal law um, and then the president would have to sort of defy federal law. And then a whole bunch of states would have to change their laws in defiance of federal law in order to move the election day. Now, presumably a state that did that would immediately be subject to uh, an injunctive effort to prevent them from moving their uh, election to a day following the day that does not comport with the federal election, uh, with, the, with the federal statute. I don't think Nancy Pelosi is going to uh, move a bill to move the federal day. And so I, I think the number of states that could get that done in time for the member election and not have it enjoined by a federal court is vanishingly small to none. So, and only and by the way, if any of them are capable of it, it's only the reddest of the red states that are likely to vote for Trump anyway. And so I think the actual likelihood of something like that happening is somewhere near zero. Um, that said, what would happen if it happened? The answer is it would be a total constitutional meltdown because you would have the president operating 
in abject defiance of a federal law on a core, democ a core question on which democracy um, depends. And you would have states com uh, complying with a completely illegal edict and in a fashion that would actually corrupt uh, the conduct of the federal national election. So I think it, I put in the category of uh, extremely low probability devastating impact events. I'm curious if any of the other panelists disagree with me about that, but I, I think the much more likely scenario um, in terms of uh, is, is behavior by the president in a fashion that undermines the integrity of the election rather than actually trying to cancel it or move it. Yeah, I mean, look, I think um, I, I agree with all that. You know, I'm sort of trying to do the like the the nightmare casting of what might happen. Um, so if we were to imagine, um, you know, really, really malicious actors at the state level, and, and they exist. So, um, uh, you know, I think if anything, we probably should plan for the worst case scenario. Um, you could imagine situations in which at the direction of the president or on their own, um, various state actors um, decided to use the uh, pretext of an emergency in order to erect barriers for particular populations to vote. So you could imagine in uh, a purple state, the purpleness of which is highly dependent on one or two densely populated urban centers, um, a red state mayor or governor deciding that they were going to uh, forbid all mass transit from running, right? Sort of basic, um, uh, you know, access sort of services like that. Um, you know, those are, uh, I think those are the areas in which we're going to, we, we might get into, into real questions about sort of legitimate legitimacy and, and respect for the outcome. Um, you know, I, I do have to say, you know, the situation in Ohio is a little bit troubling. So, um, uh, you know, essentially what we had was the governor, um, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm not accusing him of acting based on a pretext, but instead based on a sincere belief about uh, uh, the appropriate measures for him state, his state, uh, essentially acting in defiance of a federal court order um, and saying that he was going to delay this primary and so um you I think know, it was a state court wasn't it a state court um you know and so this is uh you know this is i think a cause for for concern and, and a little bit of, of alarm that you know look um we want to be crystal clear as we go into this that ultimately federal courts have the final word here and um even though you know these sort of these limited um you know, there are limited justifications for it. Um, the idea that governors might come in and, and decide, well, they're just going to do it anyway, that's an area in which um, it starts to make my skin crawl a little bit in, in candor. Yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly right. The only thing I'd add to it is that, um, and it's a good point Steve Vladek made in our live chat earlier this week, under the 20th Amendment, Donald Trump stopped being president on January 20th, 2021. That happens whether there's an election or not. So the only way he gets to stay president if there is an election. Now, maybe there's ways to manipulate along the ways, but the last states he would want to not hold, not vote on election day would be the red states, because uh, that just seems to hurt his chance of being reelected. Um, so it's a little set of a different incentives there. Um, why don't we go to the next question? Only one, and Margaret, do you have anything you want to add there? Sorry, didn't mean to catch up, no. Uh, we'll go to only one T as the next person. I'm gonna try and bring you in as a, as a panelist, only one T if we can, see how this works. Only one T, are you there? We're here. Yes, we are here. Oh, great. You can turn on your video if you want. If not, that's okay. But please go ahead and ask your question. So our question, and I think we already know the answer to it based on uh, some of the dialogue that's already been taking place, is the president um, either civilly or criminally liable for withholding aid, FEMA, or any other type of federal aid in what appears to be at least outwardly so, um, some sort of preference or, you know, deference towards red states as opposed to blue states. Um, is there any kind of uh, liability or risk there for uh, somebody in the presidency doing that, engaging in that kind of obviously uh, uh, bad behavior? Maybe, uh, uh, Ben, you want to start, start us off on that one? 
Yeah, so I can, there are a few guideposts. First of all, the civil portion is uh, unfortunately easy. Um, the case of Nixon v. Fitzgerald uh, from the uh, mid-1970s stands for the proposition that the president is absolutely immune from civil liability for all acts taken within the outer ambit of his constitutional role. So whatever liability he may have or the government may have, it is not personal civil liability to him. Uh, there are questions at the margins of what counts as covered by Nixon v. Fitzgerald. I don't think any of them involve the sort of activity you're describing. As to criminal law, um, uh, I think the answer is, first of all, none of the statutes in question are criminal statutes. Mm -hmm. There is, um, however, the, uh, at the margins of the kind of activity you're describing, there is the bribery and extortion statute. That is, if the president were to say to somebody, if you want your state to get these res respirators, you better do X, Y, and Z, you could imagine, uh, uh, depending on how it was framed, that being a, a uh, um, construed as threatening to give, threatening to withhold or promising to give a thing of value in exchange for uh, uh, some, some other uh, personal gratuity. Um, as a general matter and the limits of this, I'm, uh, I, others know better than I, uh, the courts have been pretty strict with prosecutors about not construing hardball horse trading in a political context as bribery. And the uh, both in, in the McDonald case in Virginia and uh, it's got to be really clear that the quid was in exchange for the quo and that they were linked. And so I think the likelihood of the kind of hardball that the president might play with governors being construed as, as bribery or extortion is uh, pretty minimal, to be honest. I'd be curious if anybody disagrees with me about that. So I, I think you're clearly right whenever it comes to the president not being individually, personally, civilly, or criminally liable. Um, the case that might actually end up providing the, um, the clearest roadmap for how this might go, although uh, unclear to what extent it will move to the courts at this point, is um, New York State has sued the Trump administration for suspending the Trusted Traveler Program. Um, and essentially what New York State has alleged in that case is um, the president, as he's wont to do on Twitter, essentially said that New York was very unfair to him and that um, and referred to lawsuits uh, against his foundation and, and investigations of him personally um, and he certainly created the impression that he was suggesting that if New York State did not drop those investigations um, he was going to take this action against them based on the pretext that they were a sanctuary city um, and so this is actually one of the, the first real cases in which we've seen the federal government um, and, and the president saying the quiet part out loud out, um, actually admitting that he was taking action against an individual state based on the perceived um, uh, political treatment of him by, by that state's representatives. Um, and so, you know, that's a that's a, a complicated case that sort of um, it invokes a case called Shelby County and, and equal sovereignty. And it's um, it'll be an absolute mess, although a fascinating one if it, if it ever does make it up to the Supreme Court. But um, it's more likely that we would see litigation of that variety. Uh, as opposed to, you know, an actual sort of charges against the president. Um, right. you know, ultimately, right. here, the remedy here is not court cases. It's a political remedy. And, right. and if a president behaves in really what is an egregious breach, breach of the oath and of the obligation to be president for all Americans and not just Americans who vote for him, um, the remedy for that is to vote him out of office um, and, uh, and in more exigent circumstances to impeach him. Right. Makes sense. Uh, real quick, I just wanted to let you guys know, big fan, thank you for uh, keeping all of this rolling and on uh, rational security as well. Just huge fans, uh, both myself and Mrs. T. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank for you, guys. This is very, thank uh, you. 
very encouraging and, and great. So Margaret, it looked like you were gonna say something. I, I apologize for- No, uh, no worries. Thank you so much. I was just gonna say, you know, for my part, for the, for the congressional side, I mean, this is one of the reasons that um, Democrats in particular found it to be so important to get into this stimulus bill, this congressional oversight commission that would keep an eye on how that $500 billion is being doled out to various, you know, businesses and industries because because that that's how they that's how Congress can can try to have an influence on that um, because they're very skeptical as well. And I can absolutely envision a situation where the president wants to direct money to certain, you know, donors and and more to the red states and all that. So I, I just say you know, that's one of those reasons they, they push so hard for it and why it's really important. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I'm going to move you back to attendees. Um, let's bring up, so our next question is from anonymous attendee, which means I cannot bring you up, so I apologize, uh, but I'm just going to read it out loud. Um, despite the president's response to the coronavirus, recent polls have the president's approval rating increasing to almost 50%. Do you think this is a temporary rally around the flag in the face of the crisis, or does this demonstrate a success by the administration in reframing history? The latter, will this prevent any meaningful reform? Um, Margaret, do you want, while you start with this one, as somebody who's kind of uh, worked more directly in a, a more partisan space, I think perhaps more recently than, uh, than, we ha than many of the rest of us have. I, I apologize, Scott. It was breaking up for me a little bit. Can you just read it one more time? Oh, sure. I'll jump right to the question. Um, do you think the uh, fact that the president's approval rating has increased to almost 50% is a temporary rally around the flag in the face of the crisis effect, or does it demonstrate a success by the administration in reframing history? And if the latter, will this prevent any meaningful reform? Um, I, I do think it's a temporary effect. Um, and that, and and this, we see this, and in the same effect in um, in the Bush administration, where there was a rally around the flag initially, that then tapered off. Um, <clears throat> but that said, I do think that you know, in my opinion, the sort of the propaganda machine that that the Trump um, re-election campaign and the, the and Trump himself and administration officials are helping, it is it is quite effective. I think in the media outlets that don't um, offer the sort of real facts or ask critical questions. So it, it may be the case that, um, you know, history gets rewritten for a segment of the country, uh, in particular, those who are very enthusiastic about Trump and support him. But the, the effect is just a, a temporary effect in the rest of the country. So you could see, e you know, even more sort of polarization uh, than we see now. And just really 40% of the country living in one sort of world with one set of facts and, and the rest of the country living in a, in a different world. I mean, one thing, though, I should just not to be too morbid, but you know, when people's family members and friends start literally dying and, you know, we saw in Italy that the Italian military was called in to help move the bodies, like that is pretty visceral um, for people. So I'm, you know, I hate to, to say it, but I do think that that type of, if this gets really, really bad here, which I think it could, you know, that type of visceral reality could, um, could, could sort of snap snap things back uh, in a way that that pierces through some of that what I think I think of what I'm seeing is sort of propaganda at these you know presidential uh, news conferences. Can I just add to that I I actually as appalled as I am by the president's conduct in this I actually sympathize to the rally around the, uh, the president uh, instinct uh, of, of I wouldn't express it in a poll if somebody asked me what I thought of the president's performance. But I, look, the other day I tweeted that I wasn't going to say mean things about people right now um, because I just, you know, I think it's like time for people to be nice to one another. And that has some of the same uh, like instinct behind it. You know, you go to war with the president you have, not the president you wish you had. And I am rooting for Trump to do his best. And I think for a lot of people that translates into the analytical judgment, I'm rooting for him, which means I, 
they don't distinguish between the, analy the, the judgment I'm rooting for him and the analytical judgment, I like the way he's doing it. Um, I do make that distinction, but I totally understand uh, the, I remember getting into a cab um, uh, after, shortly after 9-11 with a uh, DC cab driver who turned to me and said, you know, very aggressively, this was a, 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 a African-American DC cabbie. And he turns to me and says very aggressively, what do you think of the president? And, you know, I had no idea what to say. Um, and I just said, look, I, I, uh, I, I think he's, this was right, you know, this was right after 9-11. I said, he's the president we've got. And the guy just looked at me and said, that's exactly right. I didn't vote for the man. I won't vote for the man next time, but he's my president and I support him 100% right now. And I think a lot of people feel that way. And I think that's actually the right way to feel. I support the president 100% right now, except for the fact that I disagree with everything he's doing. And I think he's um, promoting a lot of disinformation and uh, he's handling this crisis in a way that's gonna get a lot of people killed. And I hope he's completely successful in, and I'm completely wrong. And I think for a lot of people, that's a very hard balance to maintain in your head at the same time. And so when a pollster calls you and says, do you approve of the way the president is handling this situation? Do you approve of the president? And you have to reduce it to a binary yes or no, uh, it's going to come out yes a lot more often than uh, Washingtonian politicos are going to understand. Let's go to our next question. Uh, this person's listed as A space N. Uh, but from your email, it looks like your first name's Amaya. I'm going to bring you in, uh, hopefully, to be able to chat with us face to face. Uh, did it work? There you are. Amaya, are you there? If that's your name? Uh, yes, not sure I'm visible, but hopefully I'm audible. You're audible, absolutely. Please go ahead with your question. Okay, wonderful. Um, and I should preface by saying I'm in New Delhi and the system I'm most familiar with uh, is the Indian legal system, but I've studied in the US and I have family there. Um, and so I, I wanna, take one step down from the presidency itself and look at the executive as a whole. And I've been reading news reports about uh, people who are being detained by ICE, by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, being flown around the country, sometimes to multiple destinations, uh, without sufficient attention to whether they might have been exposed to the virus or whether the fact that they're being flown might itself be a vector for the virus. Um, and, you know, sitting in a country where all said and done, the federal government can get what it wants done. It's kind of wild to me that elements of the federal government are doing things that quite independent from what the head of state might be wanting to do, uh, might be exacerbating the situation. And so I was, my question is, I was wondering if there is something that the president or somebody one or two steps down from him could be doing that would be preventing this sort of risk-taking behavior or who you think needs to step up to do something about it. Sure. Anybody want to start with that? Yeah, so I, I can take this one. Um, certainly the president has the ability to direct that ICE uh, either stop intake or uh, release particular detainees or uh, stop moving people around. Um, you know, there's broad discretion there. Um, immigration authorities and immigration judges uh, also have broad discretion not to do, uh, you know, broad discretion over, over how to handle these cases. And um, so certainly there's something that somebody could be doing um, and, and that somebody is likely within the executive branch. Uh, you know, it, it is a little bit um, interesting because uh, what we've been told sort of post 9-11 is that the great wisdom of creating the Department of Homeland Security and bringing all of these disparate agencies 
under one umbrella so that they could communicate and, uh, and act as one body. That for all of the uh, bureaucratic hassles and, and, and really um, uh, negative uh, implications of, of, of basically forming DHS and putting these various agencies within it, um, that, that this was going to be the, the real, real benefit, the ability to sort of act uh, as one body and in the case of an emergency. And so um, the fact that that hasn't happened and that agencies within DHS itself are, are actually sort of uh, contradicting one another. We have a TSA taking an ICE taking action um, that FEMA uh, you know, objects to. I, I do think is a little bit of a demonstration project that um, a lot of these supposed benefits of creating the Department of Homeland Security uh, just ultimately uh, never really did come to materialize. Maybe I have anything to add? Um, I would just add that, um, you know, there, there's an acting Secretary of Homeland Security right now. Um, there's acting positions throughout a lot of these agencies, and that has been um, a feature of the Trump administration is not having um, sort of confirm people in place who can really make decisions, who can drive the agency's actions, get, you know, push the agency to push guidelines out to all the various parts of um, the entity. So I, I guess I would just say that there, there's this underlying problem that's been the problem for three years um, that is might be being sort of exacerbated now. It's now a time of crisis um, and there just isn't that top leadership that um, has you know, the faith of the Congress and the ability to drive uh, the best decisions at the agencies forward in a, in a coordinated way. All right. Um, we've got about just under 10 minutes, a little less than 10 minutes, about seven minutes left. Um, we've got a few anonymous questions in, but I have had somebody who's had their hand up for most of this uh, session and just dropped their question. And so I'm gonna come to Candace if that's okay. Um, and let me drop, let me bring A-N out. Thank you. And Candace, I'm gonna bring you in just one second. And let's see. There we go. So Candace, if you want to unmute and uh, you can turn your camera on if you want to uh, uh, show your face, but no pressure. And uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Um, good afternoon from Oakland, California to you all. Um, on the, the same week that Ben was interviewed by Terry Gross, Terry also interviewed um, Max Brooks. Did any of you hear that interview? Um, I did not. Oh, Max Brooks is um, a sort of an apocalyptic novelist who's also an expert on pandemics. And he mentioned that there's something called the National Response Framework, which is a response network already in place to deal with pandemics, but it hasn't been activated by the president. And I, and I just wanted, I'd never heard of this before, and I just wanted to hear from any of you uh, about this. So I know a little bit about this. I don't know if anybody else wants to field it. I, I actually worked on this a little bit while I was in government uh, and then looked it up after I saw your question to make sure I was remembering what I remembering was it and it is in fact. Um, it's an interesting document. It, it, it is something that's primarily for maintaining continuity of government and promoting a nationalized sort of response for a major disruptive event. In a lot of ways, COVID fits really comfortably in there, but in some ways it doesn't. Like we, city governments, state governments, federal governments are still in place. The biggest disruption really is Congress having trouble meeting, although as Margaret and I wrote uh, this week, uh, there's ways to get around that potentially. And so far they still have been able to pass legislation. Um, so I suspect that uh, has a, a strong role in why maybe they haven't activated it yet, um, because it's really designed for a little bit of a different type of scenario, not necessarily something more serious. I think we're facing is very serious and maybe we'll get there at some point, but for some that where there's a much more significant disruption in the standard institutions of government. Mm. Um, thank you so much, Candace, for joining. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. I think we have time for one more. Um, I'm going to do this. We, our remaining questions are anonymous. Uh, so let me go back up and just read one. Um, the anonymous attendee says uh, this. You spoke of the federalism question with respect to states. Is there any difference with D.C.? 
Does the president have any powers delegated for the district that he would not have over states, specifically with his recent comment that he may give Americans to go back to work, they may presumably direct Americans, excuse me, to go back to work for health experts to give the okay? So I believe the answer to that question is no, actually. Um, the entity with uh, uh, near plenary authority over the District of Columbia is not the president, it is the Congress. And the framework that the Congress has passed to uh, exercise its rule over the district is the Home Rule Charter which basically lets the, go the gov government of the District of Columbia function mostly like a state with the proviso that Congress reserves the right to overrule anything that the district does, which it does relatively rarely. But um, so the president's authority over the District of Columbia uh, actually emanates from a different source which is the power over the federal government. So if the president were to say, okay, I want everything to get back to normal, all federal workers have to come like a normal work day anymore. We're, you know, uh, no more teleworking for, uh, for the Department of Education. Uh, that would have an immense impact on the District of Columbia, but it wouldn't be because he was overruling the District of Columbia on something. It would just be because he's managing the federal workforce. Uh, uh, I don't think beyond that, that the president has a whole lot of, I, I mean, guys, if I'm not thinking of something, let me know, but I'm not sure the district is all that differently. A lot, as long as Nancy Pelosi backs the District of Columbia and Mitch McConnell doesn't feel too strongly about it, I'm not sure the district is that differently situated from a state, it, bracketing the issue that I just described. I, th I think that's right with one possible slight gloss on that, which is that because the source of DC's home rule, uh, which has really only existed in its current form for the last 40 years, uh, implemented in the early 1970s is my recollection, uh, it is uh, statutorily based. There's a question about things like notwithstanding authorities and other exceptional authorities that sometimes trump other statutory enactments. Um, I know this has come up in other contexts. I can't think of any that would be particularly relevant here, but that there is a potential for certain statutory authorities maybe apply a little differently here than they would in states because there's no constitutional backstop to the autonomy. Instead, it's just statutory. Um, but I can't think of anything directly relevant here. I think what you said is, is probably the right answer. Anybody have anything else on that? No, I have just, to just to add to Ben's point, um, of course, if the president were to recall federal workers, that wouldn't just have implications within the district, although obviously the federal government is the single biggest employer in, in a concentrated area in, in the District of Columbia. Um, there's also would be really, really difficult questions about what it would mean in particular states. So um, state government's ability to prevent federal, the federal government from performing essential functions is relatively limited. And um, that could be one area in which we could see really, really significant clashes between federal and state authorities, significant sort of federalism concerns about uh, if the president wanted to get back to normal and, and a state thought that it was contrary to the health and safety interests of, of uh, of their communities, how exactly would um, would that play out? And in particular, how would it play out uh, between the federal government and the president and states that um, he's not inclined to sort of work through this process of mutual accommodation? Um, and so that would be um, one really, really unfortunate complication um, to an already really difficult and complicated situation. Um, but, but I do think it's one that um, is plausible, especially um, if the president continues to sort of offer these, these really aspirational estimates that, um, you know, we're going to go back to normal by Easter, um, you know, when, when overwhelming medical consensus is that, that that's just not a responsible choice. All right, and that brings us to our time uh, today. I'm, unfortunately, a few of us I know have tight commitments afterwards, so we'll have to call it there. For the folks who didn't get their questions answered, we're so sorry, but tweet at us, send us an email. Um, you never know, maybe we'll turn it into a Lawfare Post. 
Uh, if nothing else, we are usually pretty good about trying to respond where we can on Twitter. We can't thank you all enough for joining us for this conversation. Uh, and we're going to be doing more of these events so long as we're all working remotely and stuck in our houses to try and engage with you all more face to face. Uh, so keep an eye out for those opportunities. Uh, otherwise, be sure to follow at Lawfare Blog on Twitter. Check out lawfareblog.com. And uh, thank you so much for following our work. And we're looking forward, hopefully, to seeing you more of these in the near future. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.